What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are covering the single greatest Kang story of all time, uh, the one that recently completed, which has basically retold the origin of Kang, which is called Only Myself Left to Conquer. The reason why I say it's a retelling or a reworking of his origin is because Kang's origin does exist in Marvel Comics. The problem is it's scattered all over the damn place. So you've got Marvel 2-in-1 comics, you've got some Marvel premiere comics, you've got some Journey into Mystery, you've got Fantastic Four, some Avengers stuff, but you have all kinds of comics that all just sort of feed into this great big huge origin of Kang. What this does is it consolidates all the stuff that Marvel wants to keep, it changes the things they don't, and tells us how Kang the Conqueror became Kang the Conqueror. Here's the problem. This story relies on you understanding <laughs> Ramatut and Immortus and Iron Lad and all that stuff. So, um, we have to explain that before we get into this. Now, we do have a full-on explanation about Kang, but even then, people said it was still a bit confusing. So, we're going to replace Kang with you, and you are going to imagine you are Kang, and and we're gonna explain it that way. And if this can't solve it, I don't know what can. So here's the thing. <laughs> imagine you right now living your life watching this video and imagine that you suddenly discover the ability to travel back in time, right? And you can do anything you want to. Well, I mean, you're, you're like, hey, I'm gonna go back in time and conquer everything. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to the days of ancient Egypt. I'm gonna change my name and I'm gonna conquer all of existence. So you go all the way back to the days of ancient Egypt and you start calling yourself Ramatut. And because of your technology, technological advancement, you're literally taking technology as it exists right now back then. Let me tell you something, you show up there with an ink pen, you're gonna blow the minds of the people in ancient Egypt, right? They're just, they're, they're gonna freak, they're gonna think you're God, right? Like they're, they're not gonna know how to process that information, let alone if you took back something like a computer, which we couldn't use, or a notepad or something along those lines, right? Just technology that they hadn't even considered yet. So you go back in time, you change your name to Ramatut, you rule that for, for a particular period of time. Now, somebody here in the present day, doesn't matter who it is, realizes what you're doing, they go back in time and they basically chase you out out of ancient Egypt, right? They're like, you don't need to be here. Uh, you're a bad guy. In the confines of the comics, it's the Fantastic Four. Let's say whoever this person is, they basically fight you, they overpower you, and you're forced to flee, otherwise you're going to die. So your intention is to say, okay, fine. Look, I have the ability to time travel. I can go anywhere I want to. I mean, I'm not just gonna quit after being beat once, right? It's like the dating game, right? Try, try again. <laughs> and so you're like, okay, I'm gonna go back to 2022, and I'm gonna concoct a new plan on how to conquer the past. But along, along the way back, along your journey back here, suddenly you end up in limbo and you're just like, okay, what is this place, right? And you explore the whole area. You start looking around, you come across technology, different things like that. Now, while you're here in limbo, it allows you to look at the entire time stream, past, present, future, the distant future. So you can literally watch your life unfold from the realm of limbo. And what you do is you come to this realization, you're inevitably gonna become a villain. That's a problem. Not only are you gonna become a villain, now there's an infinite number of universes out there where you took different paths and did different things and caused different problems. And maybe you form a whole council of yourself, right? Like literally hundreds of you who all meet together occasionally and do some crazy stuff. And so what this does is it leads to to you as you exist in limbo saying okay i don't want to become my villainous self i don't want to become that villain version of me so i'm going to stay here and i'm going to do everything i can to work against myself here's the problem what you have here is a situation where you will inevitably have to end up going back and becoming that villainous version of yourself because you exist right it's a paradox that villainous version of yourself went back into the past and became ramatut which led you on your journey to where you are right now calling yourself immortus which means you know that's inevitably going to happen no matter what you do that's the future that's guaranteed for you so what you're doing is trying to work to keep that from happening now let's move away from that version of yourself right you're just kind of out there doing your thing now let's say that this future version of yourself in the 31st century as you're there you come to this realization people are going to work against me and it's entirely possible that even even me even even i myself may not become this version of myself that's entirely possible i may not i may lose the ability to time travel or may never gain the ability to time travel maybe i decide to go to burger king instead of mcdonald's and that shifts up everything right so now i don't have the ability to time travel any number of things could happen that could that could prevent that so what i need to do is i need to go into the past and i need to meet with with my younger self and I need to make sure that my younger self does all the things that they're supposed to do so that I can exist. And so you do that. You go back and you meet with your younger self and you basically tell your younger self, look, I'm the guy you're gonna become. And so here's what you gotta do, right? You gotta, you gotta do this thing. You gotta do all these different things over the course of time. And if you don't, you're never gonna become me. Well, your younger self looks at you and says, well, I don't wanna be you. 
Like, I have no desire to become you, right? You're a dick. Like, I don't wanna be you at all. So I'm gonna do everything I possibly can not to become you. And so as a result, you've made an enemy out of your younger self. Now, for our explanation here with Cain the Conqueror, when you went back in time and became a ruler of Egypt, that's Ramatut. That's Cain the Conqueror becoming Ramatut. When you ended up going to limbo and started calling yourself Immortus, that was Cain the Conqueror. And in the future, when you go into the past and meet with your younger self to try to get your younger self to ensure they become you, that's Iron Lad. That's how all those things work together. Having said that, I don't know how, how else to explain it besides that. If that can't explain Cain the Conqueror for you, nothing can. <laughs> Either that or I'm just that bad at it. Having said all that, spent the last six minutes explaining that, let's get into the comic. The reason why you guys are here, if I have haven't lost half of you already. So here's the thing. What this does is it initially picks up with Nathaniel Richards in the 31st century. And what he says here is he says life at this point in time really just kind of sucks. It's very, very drab and very, very boring. He says by the time he'd reached the age of 18, he had conquered nothing. That his world was a utopia of pleasure and entertainment. That his so-called betters called it post-scarcity. He called it boring. A utopia to be sure, where 10 year olds could master advanced robotics, where a boy could have his throat cut by by bullies and recover in a matter of months, which is actually what happened to him. But it was also a place where time seemed to stop, that it was the end of history, a meaningless procession of tepid moments, a countdown to nothing. That while this utopia is beneficial for society as a whole in the sense that nobody wants for anything, there is truth to the statement, conflict is in one way what gives people purpose, but is also what drives them to become better. That if people reach a point where there is no conflict, where there's no struggling or or no suffering or no pain, nobody will have a reason to improve themselves because everybody will have everything that they want. And in the face of that, what you would likely run into is a situation of stagnation. Now, whether that would happen in the real world or not, I have no idea, but it's what happened to Silver Surfer's planet. It's what happened to the people of Zen Law. They stopped focusing on religion, started focusing on science. They explored everything there was to explore in the universe. They cured every illness that could possibly plague their people. They understood everything perfectly. And suddenly there was no more reason to live because they had it all figured out. They had the answer to everything. The purpose behind life simply ceased to exist. And so what you end up getting is basically Nathaniel who goes on this kind of personal quest where he literally just starts traveling to these old places that had long since been forgotten and in a lot of ways were kind of off limits to the average person. But what he longed for was adventure. What he longed for was the this kind of bygone age, you know, an, an era that he was nostalgic for despite the fact that he never lived in it. He was kind of looking to this time when there were straight up heroes and there were straight up villains, all that kind of stuff. Fantastic Four, Doctor Doom, the Avengers, whoever in the hell else they happen to be fighting, all kinds of things. And so what he ends up doing in going to this museum, he actually ends up stumbling across a Doom bot. And that's kind of the crazy thing is because remember, Doctor Doom by this point is long since dead. And it's kind of a crazy thing because one of the big questions people have when it comes to Nathaniel Richards is who is he related to? Because Marvel's played it both ways. They've said that Nathaniel Richards is descended from Victor Von Doom, but they've also said Nathaniel Daniel Richards is, is descended from Reed Richards. Well, maybe not necessarily said that, but it's kind of been sort of alluded to over the years. And so that's kind of a funny thing because contextually, we kind of get an answer here that when this Doom bot activates, because it's just one of the creations of Victor Von Doom designed to stand the test of time, when it activates and starts attacking him, that of course this leads to King the Conqueror showing up, King as we know him, showing up here, destroying the Doom bot. And then of course the kid saying like, who in the world are you, right? Like you need to answer me. I am descended from, and then of course the whole thing gets cut off. Now that's where contextually we could argue that he is descended from Victor Von Doom. The problem here is that if he was, it's very likely the Doombot would have obeyed him when he told the Doombot to stop. So again, it's one of those things where we kind of get an answer and we kind of don't. Marvel's never really solidified it. And to be honest with you guys, I don't think they ever will. I don't think Marvel will ever give us a definitive answer as to whether or not Kang is the, the, you know, progeny or the descendant of Reed or Victor. I don't think we'll ever get an answer, but it's kind of a cool thing there is because ultimately where the two of them have this kind of conversation, Kane the Conqueror approaches this from saying like, your voice is embarrassing, right? Like there is no easier place to lie than in the pages of a book. You'll learn to trust only firsthand sources. Though I suppose compared to the 
gruel that's been that you've been raised on in this place this would appear to be a feast so let me ask you would you rather read history or would you rather make history and so the allure of this adventure the allure of being able to actually go and live these adventures that he'd spent so much time reading about that's what draws the interest of nathaniel richards and so at the end you know of course in this conversation nathaniel's like are you kidding me right like that's the only thing i want this world is so thin it's like there's absolutely nothing here and i want everything and so the response of king is good that means you're ready so now ask your question again but ask it with conviction and the kid says who are you and this guy you know king responds and says it's i've been called a thousand things right ten thousand different names by all these different worlds that i've conquered and so on and so forth like i've been called a conqueror i've been called the eternal the god pharaoh ramatut the timekeeper immortus but despite all of them there's only one name that truly rings true and that's king the conqueror and so he says in the beginning before all of it i was you and so it's an, an amazing conversation that happens here because he says through this doorway is an infinite number of times and worlds eras that sing my name and praise planets that worship me but to earn those i have known loss defeat and frustration he says i would save you that trauma and all of that time join me and own the mysteries of the cosmos join me and become king the conqueror and so in the end it doesn't take a whole lot to convince nathaniel the world he's in is so boring and it's so basic and it's so simple that in the end he's like absolutely right so he immediately joins him on this quest and what happens the first stop is king takes him to 65 million years before common era the age of the dinosaurs specifically one year before the asteroid hits that wipes out all the dinosaurs on earth and what king says is like this is your first lesson right? Time means nothing to Kang. Like, yes, I'm dropping you off here. And yes, you have a year to become you, but you think that way because you're thinking two dimensionally in a three dimensional world, right? Like it's, it's a, it's an, an interesting concept, right? Like people try to make it in the real world. How do I succeed, become successful and wealthy in the real world? I know by working for someone else. And that's not true. It's thinking two dimensionally in a three dimensional world. You have to think outside the box. What can you do on your own that can make you better absent the influence and the need of other individuals out there can you build a world for yourself or are you satisfied in living in someone else's and so that's the cool thing here is because what kang says and this is one of the most important things that he says it's easy to overlook it's easy to not take seriously but one of the things he says is he says many of my memories are fogged by the ways of time centuries of conflicting timelines playing tricks in my head but i remember every one of those first days with clarity my lessons began with survival strengthening my body and mind where I could not strengthen it myself. Kang did so for me. Now, the reason why this matters, and this kind of goes back to our initial explanation of why it was so necessary involving Immortus and, and Ramatut and all those different guys is because whenever Kang went back in time and fashioned a life for himself, he became that person. He became that person that he was pretending to be. And so here's what I want you to do, right? In order to truly understand how this impacts Kang, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put in the comments, or at least tell me, what did you have for dinner on January 26th, 2019? You can't tell me. And if you did tell me, I would probably just think you were lying, just making something up in order to, to, to be like, yep, I remember everything. No, 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 nobody remembers that. That singular moment there, right now, that's a couple years ago. And if I, if I changed that question and said, what'd you have for dinner on Monday last week? You'd be able to give me a much better guess. But instead of this being two years ago, let's pretend it's 10,000 years ago and a life that you lived for 90 years. That's what Kang contends with. That's the issue that he has. And that's why oftentimes in comics, you'll see Kang come across Immortus or or Iron Lad or something like that. And it'll almost be like they're completely different people because by all standards of measurement, they basically are, right? Like imagine you went back in time 50 years and lived out an entire life. And then at the end of that life, came back to the modern age and then just lived for another thousand years here. After a while, you wouldn't really even remember what that, what that lifetime was like when you went back 50 years ago, but it does exist. And that version of yourself is there. So it's just one of those, those weird and interesting things about Kang. It's why you do have different variations of himself, but they're also starkly different. In the end though, the cycle always continues, right? It's like Battlestar Galactica. All of this has happened before and all 
all of this will happen again. That Kang always becomes Kang, and Kang always goes and finds his younger self, and always leads his younger self to become Kang. The exception is Iron Lad, but at the end of the day, the argument still stands that Iron Lad will inevitably become Kang the Conqueror. So it's one of these things where he talks about, when, whenever he says, Kang showed me this, just imagine this cycle as it happens right now, except this young Nathaniel Richards grows up to be this adult Kang, and this adult Kang is basically reliving or retelling his experiences as you see them here. He's basically recalling the life that we're gonna see this young Nathaniel Richards live over the course of this comic. It's very metatextual, but that's why it's so loopy. That's why it goes in circles and cycles. And so that's why as, as young Nathaniel is talking about all this, he says, King showed me our life as a Pharaoh of Egypt and taught me its lesson. And he laid bare the rules of time, which lit my mind ablaze. He says his lessons were brutal, and he says I was proud when I overcame them, as I was proud of what we would build together. He taught me to shoot, he taught me to kill, he taught me that a plan, no matter how meticulous, only serves to make you weak. He forged me just as he promised, but as I was forged, so did I glimpse the flaws in the iron that made my teacher. Now, this is an important thing, because one of the things that you usually see when it comes to Kane the Conqueror is him showing up on the scene, doing some stuff, all kinds of hell unleashing, conflict unfolding, and that's basically it. You never really get to see the interpersonal side of Kang, the part of Kang that struggles. Because one of the things he says is he says that once Kang got so drunk that he could barely stand, and he took me to a far off world where he cried in the shadows as a woman died. He said one word, then was silent for days. That word being Ravana, right? Of course, Ravana Renslayer. Now the thing, the thing about this, the reason why it matters is because Ravana Renslayer was the love interest of Kang the conquer and she died right king's life literally fell apart when that happened and in fact the way that marvel wrote that it was almost kind of a question of will king ever recover from this it was focusing on that interpersonal side but you don't really see it all that often and of course even king made nathaniel swear he would never bring it up right like he, he would never mention it or anything along those lines and so what happens as he goes through this period right again back in the 65 million years that he's here as he goes through all of that of course he ends up facing off against you know some tyrannosaurus rex which is awesome blasts it with a, with a massive gun, <laughs> literally blows this thing's head off. And what he says, is, this, is, this is where things are really, really fascinating. And he says, he would love to say that in the aftermath of killing this T-Rex, that he feasted on dinosaur meat for days and he sharpened its teeth into knives, right? That he somehow honed his skills, became this brutal warrior that could live off the land. But he says, that never happened. And the reason why is because by the time I killed this thing, all I saw was her. All I saw was this one person, right? This one singular individual. And like that, she had the complete and total attention of Kang. He never had a chance, right? Nathaniel was just smitten for this woman. And what was more interesting than this is that in the society that he came from, physical touch didn't happen. You never physically touched people. It was always done as a kind of synthesis, right? A kind of, uh, you know, barrier between you and somebody else as a way to like prevent disease, illness, different things like that. And so for the first real time in his life, he's experiencing tech tactile contact with another human being. More so than that, he's experiencing love. He's experiencing desire. He's having all these feelings that he's never quite really been through before. And so having this kind of experience with her, in a lot of ways, I wouldn't go as far as to say she's in love with him. And I would even go as far as to say he's not necessarily in love with her. If anything, it's more passing curiosity. Now, that will change. That will inevitably change. But of course, she kind of invites him to her tribe. And so of course, he ends up basically chasing her down, following her to that location, and he's taken before the people here. Now, what's kind of baffling is that from Nathaniel Rich's perspective, there shouldn't be any human beings here. Now, I use that based on the real world, right? That like uh, primitive human beings appeared maybe something around 300,000 years ago that the anatomical version of ourselves that exists now is probably about 200,000 years ago. And then over time, our minds just progress to where we are right now. Uh, in Marvel Comics, one thing to know is that when it comes to the evolution of the human race, we're not really given anything before the arrival of the Celestials. Like even in Marvel Comics, they don't do that. The closest that we ever really get got in terms of those early days is maybe a little bit of discussion about proto-mutants uh, with Gabriel Shepard. The old stories with, uh, not really old story, I guess they are now. Jesus, I'm old. 20-something year old stories, 21 year old stories by Grant Morrison <laughs> with new X-Men. <laughs> Jesus, I'm old. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> 
in any event, um, we're not really given an actual origin point for when modern man first appeared in Marvel Comics. So I can almost guarantee though, it wasn't 65 million years ago. <laughs> and this race, as is being told, right? This girl, Addie and, and her race, we're not really given any information. So we don't really know if like they're time displaced or anything like that. They certainly don't act like it. But Nathaniel is brought before the lasting piece, which is basically their elder, right? The, the leader of the tribe who kind of gives us this perception that he knows who Nathaniel Richards is going to become, but he doesn't know he's going to become Kang. If anything, it's more of his actions that demonstrate who he is as a person. The fact that he saved Addy's life from a dinosaur, the fact that he killed the dinosaur, basically shows that he is a person of conviction and strength. And as a result, he's brought into the tribe and honored as a warrior by basically being given face paint. Now, the other part of this is that the tribe, again, because they're primitive, relies on, you know, prophecies from the stars and different things like that. So they're very much given to superstition, right? This kind of a thing. And of course, according to the prophecies handed down from the elders, you know, presumably the ones that came before the lasting peace and by the lasting peace himself, they're doomed to be destroyed by a star, right? By like literally a meteor crashing into earth. They don't really know that's what it is, but that's basically what it is. And so the thing about this is that Nathaniel flees to Cain the Conqueror and says, we have the ability to manipulate time. You know, time does not matter to us. So let's just take them somewhere else. Let's take them to a future, right? We can just snatch them up while they're sleeping or whatever it is, but we can take them to, you know, some period when the earth is habitable again and then go from there. Now, this is one of the most important things that goes on with this new origin of Cain the Conqueror. Cain the Conqueror's concern is not a disruption of the time stream. The reality is that it would, right? Most likely the destruction of this race serves some purpose along the timeline, right? Their bones are discovered or something like that. Somebody makes some kind of a discovery which leads them down some path where they do some things and then that leads to them becoming a superhero and changes the entire course of stuff, who knows? But regardless, like you can't necessarily meddle with the time stream in that way. And so what happens here is that when Nathaniel runs to Kang and asks like, are you awake? The response of Kang is that no, it is you who's not awake, right? You're, you dream the naive dreams of heroes, the romance of Alexander, the purity of Steve Rogers. You will unlearn this sentimentality, never disappear from my sight again. You will do as you are ordered. You will learn the lessons I teach and never disregard guard them. And above all else, you will wipe that pathetic paint off of your face. And the response of, of Nathaniel is no, that's not going to happen. And so as an answer to this, Kang simply says, I do not make requests, right? You are here by my design and shall behave by my design. Your future lies in the balance. Heed me or be doomed to a life of failure of rot and toil and insignificance. And that's when Nathaniel's like, but that's the point. You're the one who's failed. You talk endlessly about conquest and glory, but you're just a drunk who makes me memorize his defeats. How doom tricked you at the fall of Manhattan. How the Fantastic Four laid you low in the sands of Egypt. And so this is kind of back and forth argument. And in the end, Nathaniel says, my life is my own. It's out there living on without me. And the people of that tribe, we can save them from the coming cataclysm. If time means nothing to us, then why can't I use it to save the first and last in this blasted world? And in the end, the response of Kang is, you believe that because you're in love. And it's that love that makes you weak. It's that love that takes away any measure of strength that you could have. That's the stance that Kang has. His sentimentality, the fact that he's experienced love and kindness and romance, he sees that as a weakness. He sees it as the thing that had always held him back, that if he could go back and time and he could alter that younger version of himself so that he didn't experience love that that sentimentality was stamped out of him then those weaknesses would never come to fruition in those moments when he hesitated instead of killing the fantastic four due to some sentimentality or some statement made by reed or susan or something like that right like who's going to take care of our children that if that sentimentality wasn't there he would have pulled the trigger without hesitation. That cruelty would have dominated. And so in order to try to demonstrate this, he drags Nathaniel to the camp. When Nathaniel says, I will save them, the response of King is, no boy, you did not. And opens fire on the place, just incinerates, kills everybody there. Every single person dies, right? They're completely and totally killed. And Nathaniel can do nothing more than just sit there and watch. Now, this is hugely important because what he says is, it was then that I understood, though I I had crossed the fabric of space and time. I had never left my cage at all. It was then that I saw the cage was Kang. And so what he did is he basically made this promise to himself that he wouldn't become Kang. He says 
and so for the final months of the Cretaceous, I pretended to study that which King instructed, while secretly I studied the lock, how the mention of Ravana might drive my jailer to drink, how a few herbs might intoxicate a glass of wine, how the armor that had opened the way might be mine to command. I'd rarely been as tempted as I was in that moment to take the inevitable into my own hands, but his words echoed in my ear. Time would conquer all my enemies. If only I could master it. And so literally, it almost appears on the surface, this is how Kang becomes Iron Lad, but that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. Instead, as this meteor comes crashing down into the world with the intention of destroying it and basically leading to the end of all things, he ultimately ends up walking away, travels through a time portal, and when he does, he finds himself in the realm of Rama Tut. What this does is this takes place during the era of what is essentially Rama Tut. Now that's where things get a little murky because when he shows up here, it's essentially a giant battle taking place. Now this battle is between Ramu Tut and somebody else who we'll talk about here in a little bit, but on this battlefield is effectively a Moon Knight. Now one of the reasons why Colin Kelly is able to pull this off is because as you guys know, just from the history of Moon Knight and Marvel Comics, it wasn't really until Mark Spector was taken to the statue of Khonshu that the world World got its first Moon Knight. Over the years, and really when I say over the years, I mean more recently in Marvel Comics, that's been changed, right? It's kind of been a big retcon to essentially say there have been different avatars of Khonshu on Earth in the form of a Moon Knight that came before Mark Spector. And it's not uncommon for Marvel to do that. For years, for example, Danny Rand was the only Iron Fist, and then we got Orson Randall, who was the Iron Fist before Danny Rand, and there were a whole bunch of Iron Fists before Orson Randall. It had just gone on that way. The idea of there being Moon Knights that took place or existed before Mark Spector, that was largely the result of uh, Jason Aaron and his run on Avengers, specifically with Avengers 1 million. So basically this idea that there was an Avengers team that existed 1 million years before the modern era, it was largely composed of big heavy hitters. So like Odin, the original Phoenix Force as it existed on Earth, the first Star Brand, the first Iron Fist, the first Black Panther, different things along those lines, just uh, kind of giving us these different stories. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When it comes to Moon Knight, what you get here is basically this version that pops up. Now, there isn't a whole lot of explanation given here initially. Instead, what ends up happening is that this person is told, or at least Nathaniel's told by this Moon Knight, you are called by the moon. And initially, when Nathaniel chases this Moon Knight down, trying to figure out who they are or where they're going or how all this is working, that the only thing he's really told is that the voice of the knight speaks only truth. A hero from beyond time comes soon from the sky to restore the ancient ways and end the pretender's reign. Now, this is one of the things that we have to talk about here is the nature of Rama Tut and why it is that this version of Moon Knight differs from Mark Spector. So when it comes to Rama Tut, one of the things that we've talked about before is that King the Conqueror in his initial attempt for conquest had gone all the way back to ancient Egypt and basically seized control. And because of the fact that he had come from the 31st century, as has been stated by different people and in different ways, that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so King the Conqueror showing up here with advanced technology, as far as the ancient Egyptians were concerned, he was a god. Right? They were like, this guy's just capable of incredible things. This is insane, right? Obviously, this person is a god. Now, pharaohs in the time of ancient Egypt were largely considered to be avatars of God, of specifically Ra or other, uh, other individuals on Earth, but they were considered divine in nature. And so because of that, King kind of fit very nicely into how Egyptians perceived people, uh, specifically pharaohs, and the idea of magic and divine powers. And so that's why he seized control here. Now, one of the things to know is that Khonshu and the various gods that existed had long since existed here. By and large, Khonshu doesn't really care what goes on on Earth. He's got his own scheme and his own motivation. One of the things that's been recently established, especially during, um, oh my God, Jeff Lemire's run on uh, on Moon Knight, is that Khonshu seeks to basically find a vessel for himself to basically rule the world. Hence the reason why he manipulated Mark Spector and his disassociative identity disorder in order to hollow him out, quote unquote, and turn him into a vessel that Khonshu could inhabit and then rule the world. So Khonshu and the various other Egyptian gods don't necessarily concern themselves with the idea that like King the Conqueror has come from the future to the past in order to rule ancient Egypt. But one of the other things to notice here is that this version of Moon Knight wholly believes in what Khonshu told them. And not to sound too brusque about it, but the reason why is because they just don't know any better. By the time Mark Spector had become Moon Knight, people were more intelligent, they were more capable, and they were more aware of how the world exists. So the idea of gods and things like that had largely fallen away. This takes place during that era to a degree 
before the third celestial host, where you basically had the celestial showing up and telling the various gods of Earth not to intervene in the affairs of mortal men. It kind of follow, falls during that, that bit of a murky period. We can largely assume that maybe that's already happened, but whatever it is, the influence of gods and goddesses on humanity still holds strong. And that's why this person who became Moon Knight hears the voice of Khonshu and takes it as an absolute truth. Because by the time Mark Spector came around in the 20th century, the idea of people believing in gods, sure, it was there, but they didn't believe it with the same veracity, right? They didn't believe it with the same absolute belief system. It was like, eh, you know, people believed in the idea of God because they were more afraid of the consequences of not believing than the actual benefit of believing, if there is one. And so, as the two of them talk, when it comes to Nathaniel, remember, he knows the entire history of Earth. And so, what he says is, he says, far be it for me to argue with my Savior, but Ramatut isn't someone you can just hope to overthrow. Trust me, I've studied him for years. And the response to this person is, he's enslaved the entirety of creation. Now, as somebody who's never left Egypt, as far as they're concerned, Egypt is all of creation. And the, the influence of, of Ramatut just stretches into infinity. Now, of course, that's not the case. And Nathaniel says, it's only really Egypt. But like, that's plenty of stuff to rule. He says, it's his war machine against my broken suit of armor. I'm sorry, lady, but I'm not the hero that you're looking for. You're thinking of Reed Richards. Now, the reason why this matters Matters, and I love that Colin Kelly did this is because in the original story, when Ramatut first appeared in, in Marvel Comics, the Fantastic Four traveled back to Egypt, defeated Ramatut, and forced him to travel back to his timeline, right? They defeated that version of King. Now, again, as we discussed, along the way back to his timeline, he ended up in the true limbo, became a mortis, and then there's kind of a splinter timeline where he ended up going back and becoming King. But the, 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 the reality here is that what you're doing, or at least what Colin Kelly's doing, is he's basically keeping the continuity of the history of Ramatut intact, but adding to it, which is a really cool thing, right? It's a pretty beneficial thing and a very important thing. But what goes on here is ultimately Nathaniel is taken to the temple of Khonshu and is basically told, like, talk to talk to Khonshu itself and find out if there's any real truth here. The reality, though, is that Nathaniel doesn't really believe in gods. I mean, he knows that they've existed, but they're not all powerful beings. They don't really exist in the capacity the way that this, uh, this Moon Knight believes they do, that they are just people that are out there and they can be killed. And so as a result of that, Nathaniel really views gods as more of just really powerful beings as opposed to these divine individuals beyond the understanding of humanity and with a power that just simply can't be matched. The only real god that exists out there in Marvel Comics in that capacity is the one above all. Everybody else can just be killed. It just takes differing levels of power to do it. The Living Tribunal was killed by the Beyonders, the other cosmic entities as well, and the different cosmic entities have been destroyed by different beings depending on what era of, of comics you're talking about. If you're looking at Al Ewing's Ultimates, that the uh, that Eternity was basically defeated and not really killed, but overpowered by like the first firmament, right? The sentience of the first universe. So it gets a little meta and it gets a little wonky, but as the two of them continue talking, what ends up going on is that this person reveals their identity to Nathaniel Richards and we end up finding out this Moon Knight is actually Ravana Renslayer. Now, here's the thing to understand here, and this is why I say from this point going forward, the entire history of Ravana Renslayer is gonna be completely rewritten, or at least her, her origin is gonna be completely rewritten. The original origin of Ravana Renslayer is she's from the 40th century, and that you ended up having a time where Kane the Conqueror had arrived there, but ultimately spared the place because he was in love with her. And then it was a kind of love-hate relationship where they loved each other, then they hated each other. She killed him a couple times. <laughs> it was just one of those things. There was literally a point where she resurrected him just to kill him. It was, it's kind of nuts, right? It was that level of hate and disdain, but it was very much a love-hate, if anything, a passionate relationship between the two. What it looks like Colin Kelly's doing is reworking the entirety of that by introducing Ravana Renslayer here and saying she is a Moon Knight and then presenting her to us in this way. What it looks like is this is where Ravana Renslayer starts. This is where her origin begins. Instead of it being in the 40th century, she was just a person in Egypt and ended up becoming a host for Khonshu as the first first Moon Knight, or one of the Moon Knights, presumably the second Moon Knight after uh, Avengers 1 million, and she just kind of goes forward from there. But again, things will be explained as time effectively goes on, because we'll actually see different versions of her in different points in time across this story. So it'll be a little murky to a degree, not gonna lie, a little ambiguous there, but at the end of the day, she presents herself as a person that wholeheartedly believes in the idea of Khonshu. And what ends up happening is Nathaniel kind of says, I do not believe in gods. In my life of conquest, I have crushed countless divine skulls in my hands, but even before I saw fear in the eyes of the God of Thunder, and yet he recalls those thoughts by Kang, 
never love. And he says, in that place, my mind ran clear. The past, the future, like a river of blood from my mind to Kang's neurokinetic armor. Time and memory coursed through my veins. I swore that I would be the hero she saw in me. I swore to tear him down. And she says, in the shadow of a dead god, I took my revenge and cast it in iron. And so what this says, and this isn't necessarily something that's absolutely solidified in the modern era. What this says is that this younger version of Kang basically becomes the first Iron Lad. Now, I say that as if there's more than one Iron Lad. I mean, I guess it, technically there kind of is, but not necessarily. The reality here is that in the end, it is all Kang, right? So this kind of origin still rings true, right? The origin of Kang. But what one of the things to know is that in the old school, or not really old school, but in the young Avengers stories, that the idea of Iron Lad was basically a younger version of Kang that didn't want to become Kang and did everything he could not to become Kang. But in the end, every origin of everybody stems from Kang in the 30s and 31st centuries. And so because of that, they are all destined to become Kang. Eventually, Immortus goes on to become Kang. Iron Lad goes on to become Kang. Everybody originates from Kang because he was a guy that basically went back in time and initially started it all. And that's why if you look at characters like Kang the Conqueror or even like uh, Reverse Flash, Eobard Thawne in DC Comics, the reason why they're basically indestructible in the sense that you can never truly kill them is because they effectively exist simultaneously at different points in time. And so because they exist at different points in time, they can always reappear at any point in time. So imagine you, for example, traveled back to, I don't know, like the first century, right? Just some arbitrary point in time. Uh, you exist in the first century, but because we have branch universe theory, there's also a reality or a timeline where you never traveled back in time. And so if somebody were to go to that point where you quote unquote went back in time uh, and they stopped you the moment before you did and they killed you, then what that would mean is you would still exist in the first century. You would still be there. There. Instead, there is a branch universe that exists out there now where you died before you could go back in time. So you could never truly kill that person. It's one of those things where in, in Marvel and even DC Comics, once a person learns the ability to travel through the time stream, the instant they make their first attempt or their first travel through time, they can never truly be destroyed now. They can always just reappear at any point in time. So it's really kind of murky and it's really, it's, it's very, very ambiguous. And I know when it comes to time travel, it can be a little confusing, but it's essentially a way to unlock immortality using technological means. But the result of this is that as Iron Lad, really the first time he becomes this character, he basically ends up helping the forces of, of Moon Knight and this what seems to be this rebel faction facing off against Ramatut and trying to bring down his rule. Now, the reality of this and what's really, really cool is that in these various battles that they're a part of, there is a larger force pulling the strings when it comes to these forces that are trying to destroy or bring down Kane the Conqueror. We'll get to them here in a second, although I imagine some of you guys have already guessed who that person is one of the greatest characters of all time <laughs> whom i absolutely love uh but one of the things to know is that as the, these battles are fought that it's really more of a series of battles as part of a continuous war and as you know battles end. And so in these bits of lulls, there's a very deep and personal connection that's formed between Nathaniel and Ravana Renslayer. And it's kind of interesting because she asked the question, in the place that you come from, is this place remembered? And he says, in the time that I come from, everything is remembered. Imperfectly and through the lens of the victors perhaps, but remembered all the same. That was the problem. When everything's been done before you, what can your life possibly be worth? But I knew I was definitely destined for more. Even before Kang came to visit me, I knew. And the response of Ravana is, I have never known a life without destiny. I remember nothing before it. My parents were the will of Khonshu, and they have long ago vanished into the sunlight of my memory, if they were ever there at all. And the response here is that Nathaniel asks, did he give you your name? your God. And her response is, no, my name has always been, but he did give me yours. And that's when she says, like, I was told you were coming here. But in this moment, he recalls the words that Kang had spoken to him when he was effectively trying to rid him of weakness and saying, never love, lest you be conquered. But the thought of Nathaniel here is, but he knew nothing of love, I was absolutely sure. He was a creature of hate. When you are young, it is so hard to see that one is only born from the other, that without love, love to inspire it Hate is simply just rage. Anger can be conquered by calm, but like its pathetic cousin regret, hatred 
just feeds. It makes one ruthless. It drives the preparation of armories and the shattering of centuries. It intertwines with the power of a parasite around the brainstem. Love makes one blind as hatred makes one see. And it is in that way that we fell under his eye. What Nathaniel's really saying here is that when it comes to the ideas of love and hate, they really are intertwined. Kang hates the person he became because he experienced love, because he fell in love with Ravana Renslayer. And he saw that idea of love as the thing that made him weak. That rage is directionless. Rage has no real drive or ambition. It's a thing that exists as a byproduct of experiences, things that have maybe happened to you, but it's not necessarily born in love. But love is, is an intensely positive emotion, and I would argue the most positive emotion. Hate can be born out of love, which drives you to the most negative emotion. The reality here is that he sees Kang as becoming the person he did because he experienced love. But in his desire to reflect refuse to become Kang, he embraces love. He seeks love. And in fact, that's where he and Ravana Renslayer effectively fall in love. Now, again, this is why I say this new origin of Ravana Renslayer is a little ambiguous here because the answers she gives Nathaniel on her origin are cloak and dagger at best, right? And it may just be smoke and mirrors. She's like, well, I've always had my name. Maybe it's a name that was given to me by my parents, but I don't really even know if my parents existed anymore, right? Their memory, the memory of them is basically gone. And it's one of those weird things because you would think that for a person and her age, which, you know, just going on the way she's drawn looks to be maybe in her late 20s, early 30s, she would very definitely remember her parents. But the idea here is that potentially her parents may have died and when she was at a very young age, in which case it may be one of those things where her memory just doesn't really recall a lot of her parents because she was so young when they died. There's no definitive answers given here, but you could look at it from a different perspective and say she's very much like Ramatut. She basically came here at some past point in time and she came here from the future because of all the different adventures and escapade she'd gone on, but at the end of the day, uh, she's just following the same path as Ramatut. She doesn't remember a whole lot about herself. But what goes on is that once the two of them are captured and they're brought before Ramatut, that, uh, that initially Ramatut actually ends up blasting uh, Ravana Renslayer with what's known as the Ultra Diode Ray. And it's basically a weapon well used by Kane the Conqueror is how he ensnared a lot of the people under his service and basically forces her into a position of, of being a, a subject, right? It takes away her willpower. And in fact, that's seemed to be the way in which he was able to form his initial higher council and then in turn position himself as a god king. Now the response of Nathaniel is of course to lash out, one part because he's in love with her and two because he knows that Ramatut is king from a different point in time. Now remember, as time would pass, Kang the Conqueror and Ramutut would eventually become their own distinct personalities. But Ramatut does remember his his idea or remember him being king at one point in time and so that's why he he kind of recognizes Nathaniel Richards to a degree insofar as like Iron Lad, different things like that, but he doesn't have any memory of this sort of encounter taking place because it's never happened before, or at least it doesn't seem to have happened before. One of the big issues is that King's entire history is a time loop. And so seemingly this has happened before. It's just for whatever reason, every time feels like the first time, which is kind of weird. I know it's, we're not even gonna go into that because it just seems wonky. It just seems really, really meta. And honestly, it would just take too long to explain. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, Rama Tut really says, like, I have no memory of this, right? A divergent timeline, perhaps some kind of a variant or a new loop, whatever it is, what this means is that killing you would no more affect me than the destruction of an alien son. And the response to Nathaniel is smart here. He says, but Rama Tut is a footnote in our story, barely even a prologue. You don't even know our true name. I would think very hard before you execute me, the throat you slit may very well be your own. That means Cain the Conqueror will never come into existence. And if Cain the Conqueror never comes into existence, there's no one to come back in time and to be you. Now, the reality here is that Colin Kelly is jumping back and forth between a linear timeline and branch universe theory. The reality here is based on Marvel's branch universe theory, if Rama Tut were to kill uh, basically Iron Lad, it wouldn't make any difference. It would have no real involvement in any real capacity whatsoever. It would just be a thing that happens. And that would basically be it. Uh, that's kind of how that branch universe theory concept works in Marvel Comics. But at the end of the day, what he says is, you know what? You're absolutely right here. Uh, you know, killing you is too much of a risk. However, using you is a great strategy because you're technologically advanced. You have access to essentially all my resources and even some of the resources that I don't have access to. So we'll turn you into a servant instead of killing you. And so by blasting him, he basically turns him into what is in effect the first Scarlet Centurion. Now, one of the big differences between this and comics as they were originally written is that when Kane the Conqueror was on his way back to his time stream, he 
did end up arriving in the modern era due to a time storm and encountered Doctor Doom. In their first encounter and somewhat inspired by Doctor Doom's armor, basically Kane got rid of the Ramatut guys and then basically started calling himself a uh, Scarlet Centurion. Of course, again, that was covered in, well, it was covered in a few different places. It was like Avengers Annual Number 2. God, it was like Captain America Annual Number 11. And I want to say it was in Fantastic Four. No, it wasn't. It was a What If story. I don't remember the exact issue of the What If story. I think it was issue number 20. Yeah, it was What If issue number 29 um, that all this stuff was basically explained and, and whatnot. But the thing behind this is that giving us this indication as the first Scarlet Centurion, what it does is it sets the stage for the idea that in a lot of ways, Cain the Conqueror just kind of inspired himself to become the people that he was. But making Nathaniel into Scarlet Centurion, he ends up leading the forces of Cain the Conqueror, albeit against his will, against the force that is controlling all these individuals out there that are fighting against the rule of, of Ramatut and trying to conquer his kingdom. Of course, all of them being led by Apocalypse, which I love. Now, this is one of the things where Colin Kelly is basically kind of blowing off the old adventures of uh, Cyclops and Phoenix, which is where you got the initial origin of Apocalypse, where basically he was rising to power around the same time that uh, Ramatut was defeated. And the way he's depicted in this comic, he's already in possession of celestial technology. That hadn't happened yet in the old school story. So basically it's Colin Kelly kind of rewriting the history of Apocalypse to a degree, which is fine. The origin of Apocalypse, I mean, it's there, but I never really took it as an absolute truth. And it's one of those things where anybody could rewrite it in virtually any way. And it's fine if they did. For the most part, people don't really care about Apocalypse <laughs> before he became Apocalypse. They care about him after he became Apocalypse because that's when he got awesome, right? So it's cool to see him leading this force. Now, of course, with Apocalypse at what is in effect the height of his power, because once he achieved this level, his power never really increased. He was just at this state for seemingly thousands of years before the modern era. But the thing about this is that at this point in time, he's wildly powerful and wildly capable. But in the end, the battle is a pretty severe and extreme battle. And so what Nathaniel says it was is that it was in those days that I first knew war. I learned the way of scream sounds when it is someone's last and how fear alone can stop a heartbeat even before death. Love made me blind, and so I began to hate. I saw the only path forward. My body was a prison, my armor a cage. To escape King's power, both needed to be broken. And he says, and through the pain, I swore I will have revenge on King. I will have revenge on King. And, he's, and that's the thing he keeps saying, to motivate himself. And that's the thing he kept saying to remind himself. Now, by the time he gets back to the Citadel of King, where King is basically operating, that's when he sees the Fantastic Four fighting against Kang and then ultimately pushing him back to his timeline. And of course, that's how his history kind of unfolds. The original Scarlet Centurion as we initially saw him in the old Fantastic Four comics and so on and so forth. But the reality here is he says that within a day of Ramatut's escape into the time stream, his kingdom fell to chaos. That Apocalypse took all he wished and burned the remnants. No record of Ravana Renslayer like a footprint in the sands of the desert. She was scattered to time. I told myself a lie in those days. None are lost in the light of the moon, but I knew better than to believe it. She was as dead as the god she served, but Kang was still alive. And so that's why things are a little murky here is because again, maybe Ravana Renslayer comes from the future. She went to the past. She basically forgot her own history and believes she had always just existed there and then became a Moon Knight. It's one of those things that we'll explore as the story goes on. But the final act in basically trying to get back to his time, because in effect, he doesn't really have the same level of technology that he used to have. He's stuck in his Scarlet Centurion suit is he goes to the only person who has a level of power that could get him through the time stream. He goes to Apocalypse and he simply says, together, we can destroy Kang the Conqueror. I was reading over the comments of the previous videos after I got back, and I noticed that some of you guys were a little confused in terms of how the whole Kang the Conqueror thing works and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so as you guys know, when it comes to Marvel Comics, the main Marvel Universe is Earth 616, right? That's well established. You guys have all pretty much known that for quite some time. What you have is you do have a Nathaniel Richards from Earth 616, but that is the Nathaniel Richards known as the father of Reed Richards. So if you ever read Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run, that's Nathaniel. 
right now he does have time traveling escapades and so on and so forth and he was part of kang war different things along those lines but when you think of kang the conqueror right prime kang if you want to call him that the main kang the conqueror who goes back in time and fights the avengers and all that kind of stuff he comes from a reality called earth 6311 this story as it's being told is basically the origin of kang the difference here is that unlike what a, a lot of the stuff that you read before it's designed to basically rework his origin slightly as well as massively rework characters like Ravana Renslayer. And the reason for that is because coming out of the Loki TV show, Ravana Renslayer is a very popular character, or at least pretty popular, way more than she ever was in the comics. <laughs> and so there was a lot of confusion with her character in the comics. If Loki had literally ended and said, for more about Ravana Renslayer, go read Marvel Comics as she exists right now, it would confuse the piss out of people. They would have no idea where to start or which version of her it is or anything like that. It was, it was just, it was a massively complicated thing, right? She was just kind of thrown in there with the time traveling escapades of Kang and there was no real explanation given insofar as how it all ties together. This story corrects that. The other part of that is that where this story focused on answering the question, this idea that when Kang the Conqueror was a teenager, some future version of himself just showed up and said, I'm going to turn you into me, that where it had focused on younger Kang trying not to become his older self, this video right here is where everything begins to shift. So in the last video that we covered, we had basically talked about how there was the, it was really younger Kang ending up in ancient Egypt and coming across Rama Tut, who, as you guys know, was Kane the Conqueror going back to ancient Egypt and then basically trying to rule there and then conquer the earth from that point going forward. Ultimately, though, there was a great big war taking place between uh, Kane the Conqueror and Apocalypse. And so as a result of that, what you ended up having was younger Kang, who basically allied himself with what appeared to be Ravana Renslayer in ancient Egypt, and then in turn, helping, uh, helping Apocalypse fend off and really defeat the forces of Rama Tut, of course, with, with Kang basically fleeing back to his present after being defeated by the Fantastic Four, who had time traveled to that time period. Again, we had covered more of that in the video, so if that's a little confusing to you, I, I invite you to go back and check out that video. The thing about it is that after that whole conflict is ended, right, that adult Kang fled back to his own time, and all you're left with is younger Kang here. In that whole series of events, that whole calamity, Ravana Renslayer had effectively died. And so as a result of that, because Ravana Renslayer Slayer had basically appeared intermittently throughout the time stream and really defied anything regarding like the laws of aging or anything like that and no explanation has been given yet which we will we'll get an explanation on that um basically you have young Kang who's in love with Ravana Renslayer he has a vendetta against his older self and then he also wants to find a way to save Ravana so what he ends up doing is making a deal with Apocalypse now as you guys know Apocalypse as a villain this guy's nothing if not just beholden to evolution right the guy believes in social Darwinism only the strongest deserve to survive. It's one of the reasons why Apocalypse is a little hypocritical in some ways. On one hand, he'll make these grandiose speeches about how evolution will have its due, and only those who, who are able to deal with, you know, strength and, and, and show how capable they are, are the ones who deserve to live. All the while, he basically used the techno-organic virus as it was given to him by Cable, albeit inadvertently, to interface with celestial technology and grant himself all these powers. So, if he was really living up to his own belief system, he never would have done that. He would have just used whatever powers had been naturally given to him to find some way to be a conqueror. So basically, it's a long way for me to say that when it comes to his life philosophy, Apocalypse is full of shit. So the thing about this is that what he does is he tells Nathaniel, like, I will give you the ability to travel forward in time, right? To travel to, you know, your future or whatever time period you need to go to, but you will not do it using some kind of time machine or anything like that. You will do it as at the whims and wants of time herself. And so instead of him just being given the ability to travel into the future by way of some sort of machine or something like that he's actually encased in a sarcophagus and left there for like thousands of years where he just kind of goes forward right literally just sitting there in this case now the thing about it is that that kang doesn't really say that this is any kind of a torture i mean psychologically it is to a degree but in order to keep himself from going insane he steals himself right he says time is a thing to be conquered that was the edge of king's knife not tactics nor technology nor superpowers nor brutality time travel but even without a machine we all travel through time slowly and ever forward so with my flesh protected from age by apocalypse's arcane technology but my mind restlessly aware i did that one thing that king would find abhorrent i took the long way around and all the while i sharpened my mind and steeled my focus i had many coming victories to contemplate but i was drawn particularly to the failures the ones i had been trained to prevent i contemplated Ravana, the mystery 
of her name echoing on my elder self's lips and of meeting my own Ravana in the distant past. I shed my boyhood to make myself her murderer's undoing. And finally, in the shadow of 26,964 years of preparation, meditation, and patience, I arrived. And so he basically shows up here in what's essentially the modern era, right? The modern day. And when I say the modern day, I mean like the Avengers in the 1960s really is, is, is really what I'm referring to here. <laughs> but when he arrives here, this sarcophagus, of course, is discovered. And of course, he ends up breaking out and so on and so forth. But as he's here, of course, he overhears a news blip on the radio from J. Jonah Jameson, where basically there's some kind of a UFO, right? A hovercraft out there that's just like wreaking havoc and the Avengers are fighting it and so on and so forth. And when they don't quite know what to make of it, and in fact, Jameson asks a question like, is it invaders from outer space? Kang is like, no, that's my future self who's arrived here with the intention of attacking the Avengers team. Now, what's really, really interesting about this, and this is what's really, really cool, is that you have younger Kang who shows up to this vessel. Now, in his mind, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time with the Avengers. They're really more of an afterthought here. And that's one of the things that's so cool about this story is whenever we traditionally read comic books, the Avengers or somebody like that, they're always in some capacity the main focus, right? Like here's a Spider-Man story where Peter Parker's doing his thing and something happens and some villain shows up and you know, whatever, he's really, really strong. Peter can't do it on his own. So here come the Avengers and now it's a team up book. You don't really see instances where it's just like, and there are the Avengers over there doing something. Let's go back to what it is that we're doing here. Like you never really see that all the time, right? And it's really, I really enjoy, it's one of the things that I love about books like this is it's basically Kang, like younger Kang, who's like, I got to fight my older self. And it's cool to see the Avengers because I remember seeing them when I was a little kid, way, you know, in the far flung future, you know, when he's from the 31st century, but he's like, I remember seeing them as a little kid studying about them and like the museum and the libraries and different things like that. So it's kind of wild to actually see them here. And they kind of look like, I always imagine them in my memory that they were much bigger than they are. You know, they're just people here who do some stuff. So there is a bit of nostalgia here, but it's one of those things where he doesn't quite have time to sit back and marvel at the Avengers fighting against, you know, the forces of Kang the Conqueror. Instead, Kang, like younger Kang, ends up going into the vessel. Now it's one of these things and this is a really, really important aspect of this. He says, so as the Avengers fought Kang with shield and hammer, I approached not as Alexander, but as Odysseus. I made Kang's time ship know me as a friend for none could access its arsenal but Kang. Perhaps, as I recall it now, that moment was the first time I was truly him. And the reason why he says that, and the reason why this is so significant is because over the course of this story, younger Kang has been doing everything he can to prevent himself from becoming older Kang the Conqueror, from like becoming that villain. It's a cool thing here because in the midst of this battle, of course, the Avengers kind of get the upper hand, Kang's ship is, is on the verge of getting ready to take off, and younger Kang ends up confronting older Older Kang. So, like the videos that we've done in the past, we'll refer to younger Kang as Nathaniel, and older Kang is just Kang, right? We'll just call him that. So, the thing about this is that Kang does not recognize Nathaniel Richards, and the reason why he doesn't recognize him is because Kang has not met him yet. Now, I know it sounds confusing as hell. <laughs> this is why I say Kang stories, man. You have to really approach these carefully, like especially if you're if I'm making a video about this, I have to approach it very, very carefully because I could just blow through it the way that we normally do with stories. It would confuse the out of you. So here is a super simple explanation to why it is that Kang does not know Nathaniel. So in a previous video, we talked about how Kang, despite only being probably in his 30s or so, has traveled back and forth through time a ton of times. And as a result of that, you could argue he's cumulatively lived a thousand lifetimes. And so it's very, very easy to just forget things. Now, what's important about this is that Kang the Conqueror, at this point in his history, has not traveled back to find his younger self and basically train his younger self and teach him everything he needs to know to prevent him from losing. This is the point in the story when Kane the Conqueror is facing off against the Avengers and losing. So he hasn't come to this realization, what if I just go back and grab my younger self and basically correct all my mistakes in that younger self so when my younger self becomes me, they won't have all the flaws that I have now. They'll be a better version of me so they never make the same mistakes and they ultimately come out on top right? That's why Kang does not remember Nathaniel because he hasn't met him yet because he hasn't come up with that idea to grab Nathaniel and teach him everything he needs to know to ensure 
that Kang does not lose in these various fights that he engages in. Now, the thing about this is, remember, Nathaniel doesn't want to become Kang. So even though he accesses the ship by pretending to be Kang and so on and so forth, he still stands against him, right? And one of the things to keep in mind is he still harbors a lot of love for Ravana Renslayer. And he's still very, very mad about the fact that she died in ancient Egypt because of the actions of Kang when he was pretending or operating under the moniker of Rama Tut. And so what he says is that his intention is to eradicate Kang, right? To kill Kang here and now on this ship. And by doing so, it would remove him from the time stream in its entirety. At that point, he would go back into the past in ancient Egypt and he would save the life of Ravana Renslayer. Because if he were to go back in the past and save the life of Ravana, Kang would always end up back there because it's just his history. He would always become Rama Tut. He would always exist in ancient Egypt. And that situation with how Ravana died would always repeat itself. But if he can kill Kang and by doing so, purge him from the time stream in its entirety, then ultimately he can go back to ancient Egypt, he can save the life of Ravana, live a, live a life with her, and never have to worry about Kang showing up there to wreak havoc in any capacity because he's dead, right? Like, there, there's no Kang to travel back and forth in time anymore. And so the response of Kang is, that's insane. Like, do you have any idea what you would do if you did that, right? Like, I've, I'm so ingrained in the time stream, you would quite literally break time itself. But if I didn't exist and you killed me, it would destroy time. There has to always be a Kang. There needs to always be a Kang the Conqueror traveling back and forth through time, engaging in these different things because this is how it's supposed to work. It's kind of ambiguous and it's very metatextual in terms of how it's explained, but really it points to the greater argument here that in Marvel Comics, there does always have to be a Kang, right? Kang always comes into existence. It always ends up that way. I mean, I guess maybe there's a universe out there where there is no Kang the Conqueror, but that universe Universe has never been seen, right? Kang always exists in every universe across the multiverse, seemingly every single time. Now, what's crazy is that in the midst of this argument between the two, suddenly they're met by the arrival of Victor Von Doom, of Dr. Doom's son. Now, here's a cool thing, right? Dr. Doom would normally never intervene here, and he certainly probably wouldn't take the risk of showing up and confronting Kang the Conqueror in his own ship, where he's at his most powerful. But the opportunity is too good of a chance to pass up. That Dr. Doom, watching the entire conflict between Kang and the Avengers, and even being able to see what's going on here using sorcery and mysticism and whatnot, came to the realization there's two Kangs here. There is Kang from the future and Kang, for, Kang from the past, right? His younger self. If he can eradicate both, then ultimately it would save Doom a lot of hassle and grief and Kang like standing in his way regarding domination. Because one of the things to know is that it's kind of an unofficial competition between Doom and Kang in the sense that like Dr. Doom wants to conquer the world, but so does Kang the Conqueror. And so they usually end up bumping heads in terms of their various schemes. There is a kind of respect among them. It's grudging in the sense where Doom like respects what it is that Kang's capable of and Kang respects Doom. Then there's also the, the link that Marvel has kind of created or teased but never actually solidified that Kang the Conqueror may very well be descended from Doctor Doom. We never get a definitive answer on that. We don't know if that's actually the case. But regardless of the situation, Doom sees this as a chance to take out two birds with one stone. And so what you have is a massive battle that basically takes place between between the three of them to a degree. Now, when I say to a degree, it's because it's really more Kang the Conqueror trying to take out Dr. Doom, and then it's Nathaniel trying to reason with Kang. And the reason why he says that is because he says, look, ultimately the immediate threat here is Dr. Doom, but you, in, in you know, in, the, in your future, will come back and find me. And when you find me, you're going to take me to the through the time stream, and you're going to try to correct all the flaws in yourself by correcting those flaws in me, teaching me those lessons. Never love, different things along those lines, right? Love is a weakness. The, the, the fact that you fell in love with Ravana Renslayer is what led to you becoming as weak and incapable as you are. If I don't have any of those weaknesses, I will become ruthless in a way that you never were. I will become every ounce conqueror. But at the end of the day, I can just teach you those things myself. I come from what is in effect your future right? Like, I know your history. I know what happens to you. Like, I know these conflicts, right? I know what happens to you running all the way up until, like, the 31st century. So, I know how your battles with the Avengers will unfold. I know all that stuff. So, just let me teach you those things, right? Let me teach you how you lost so that you can win. And so, as a result of that, the bargain is struck. The deal is made. Kang says, okay. They basically end up ejecting uh, Doctor Doom from the ship using, using, you know, time mechanics. And then, once Doctor Doom's out of the picture, the response of Kang is, okay, 
hey, let's do this. And the response of Nathaniel is no, right? Doom was 100% right. Kang is not to be trusted. Your time is done. And he fires on him. He literally executes his older self, right? Just kills him right there and then shoots him to death. And it's just this amazing moment where, where Kang says, Kang is dead, long live Kang. And the argument that he makes here, what he's basically saying is, you are gonna become me. There's no way you're not. There's no way you can't, right? Like you are doing exactly what I would have done, right? Like you, like whether you know it or not, you are walking headlong into this role. You're walking headlong into becoming Kang. And so that's what's so funny here because at this point, once Kang is dead, Nathaniel says, okay, now I can execute my plan. I can don the moniker of Ramatut and I can go back to ancient Egypt and I can save the life of Ravana Renslayer. I won't use the diode raid that forces her to bend to my will. Instead, like I will, I will conquer Egypt, right? I will see my young Herself. So in effect, it's exactly everything that we saw happening in the last video that we covered. It's all unfolding. The difference here is that the motivation of Ramatut is different, but everything else is the exact same, right? His younger self is there, so on and so forth. And he tells Ravana, like, okay, so like, like basically, I'm gonna take you to a place where I'm gonna keep you safe, right? I'm gonna take you to the citadel. It's gonna keep you safe. Everything's gonna be fine. But he still operates as Ramatut. By all standards of measurement, he's still a villain because it's the role he has to play in order to save the life of Ravana. You see how he's falling down this path of becoming Kang, right? Like you see how like he's just continually becoming this guy. And that's when the Fantastic Four show up and they see him as Ramatut, the fight unfolds. And so he says, I did exactly what Kang the Conqueror would have done, right? What Ramatut did initially, I fled. So regardless of the fact that he's trying to do things differently, in the end, he's doing them the exact same way. The timeline unfolds the exact same way. And that's really the bigger focus here is that time is not something you can just control and manipulate however you want to, it has a finite form and function. It starts at A and it ends at Z. And that there are things that happen in between where you can kind of fudge them a little bit. But at the end of the day, there are fixed points in the universe's history that cannot be changed, that cannot be modified, they cannot be adjusted. There are universal constants that have to exist in the universe. King the Conqueror is a universal constant. Ramatut's existence is a universal point in the time stream. That cannot be adjusted. It always happens. How it is that he wants it to happen is irrelevant but it always happens, right? He basically, like, like, no matter what would take place here, no matter what his thought process would be, no matter what would happen, it would be him traveling back as Ramatut, and he would give people science, but he would still be Ramatut. There's no way to escape that. So what ends up happening is once he is, once he flees and gets away as best he can, he ends up in the far-flung future, in 4000 AD. And the first person he's greeted by is Ravana Renslayer, which begs the question, how did Ravana Renslayer survive from the days of ancient Egypt Egypt to now. So in Earth, in, in the 40th century, as a, the way that you're seeing this play out, where it's quote unquote Ramatut who ends up in the 40th century, that's technically accurate. That's the way it played out in comics originally when it came to Kane the Conqueror. The difference here is that this version of Ramatut is not the same as the way it was originally done in Marvel Comics, hence the reason why we're getting this change in origin. That Ramatut was the tried and true Kang operating under the guise of Ramatut. He was ultimately defeated by the Fantastic Four, fled back to his era, ended up in the 40th century century. And so in, in the way the comics were originally told, it was basically a different version of Ramatut than the one that we see here, right? Nathaniel, his motivation for why he did what he did when he was Ramatut was totally different. Him operating as Ramatut here now in the 40th century is different. But again, it's Marvel basically solidifying that no matter what Nathaniel does, he will always become Kang and he'll always follow the path of the person that ends up becoming Kang, that is unavoidable and there's no way to escape it. The way we know this is that when he shows up here, what he finds himself in is basically a war-torn territory. Now, one of the big differences here is that in the original stories, the way it was told by Ramatut, right? So Avengers 269, Captain America Annual Number 11, Ravana Renslayer didn't exist, or at least she wasn't there when he appeared in the 40th century, not in the way that she is here. So again, it's Marvel just kind of shifting things around and really retelling the origin of Ravana, which really kind of begs the question, is Kang Volume 1 a retelling of, of Kang's origin or a reworking of Ravana? right? Like if you had to pick one as the main focus of the story, which one would it be? I mean, technically it's both, but which one does it lean more towards, I guess is the more accurate question to ask. But when he shows up here, of course, immediately being met by Ravana, the, the whole idea behind life in this future is that it's very harsh, right? It is a very harsh and just a battle hardened life. And more often than not in Marvel comics, that's how the future is depicted to us. It's given to us in different ways, but the future is shown as a very hard and bleak and dark place, right? Days of future past, the era of apocalypse in the far-flung future, right, when apocalypse rules the world, this era of Kang, like 
all these different things, right? It's a very harsh and difficult place to be in, right? New Canaanites versus the Chosen or the Clan of Kaba or whatever it is. It's always that kind of thing, right? So it's, it's really interesting to see that Marvel sort of keeps this maintained. But against these forces, what you have here is Ravana Renslayer leading, by all standards of measurement, a primitive race for the most part. That there are weapons and arms and armament here, but because of, because of the fact that society as it existed at the time had effectively collapsed, these arms and armament are beyond Ravana Renslayer and her people's ability to understand. They can use them to a degree, but they can't use them to their fullest potential. And so what's really cool is that as the two of them fight together, much like what we saw in their initial appearances in ancient Egypt, they fall in love just like they did before. That their love is born and bred in conflict just like it was before. And the two of them working as a group face off against the, the these barbarian hordes just like they did before. The big difference here though is that what you have is this point where once these forces are defeated, again, the, the world's not saved, so to speak, it's just this kind of immediate battle, that what you have is that with these forces essentially defeated, that Nathaniel tells Ravana like you're like like you're amazing and 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 I love you. The thing about this though is that he always speaks of a time in which they'd known each other in the past. She doesn't know him. She's as far as she's concerned, she's never met him. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to kind of continue on the life they could have had with a person who knows nothing of that life, right? As far as she's concerned and the way that she feels, he feels like he's losing her and he's pushing, you know, forcing himself on her and she's rebuking him in that way, right? I mean, she she's growing to care about him, but he's basically moving too hard too fast. And as a result of that, he basically tells her like, we can leave this place, right? Like, like together we can leave, we can leave this life behind and we can go to a place where we can live a glorious life. And when he gives her that revelation, she immediately turns against it. Now, there's a few different reasons as to why she turns against it and turns against him. The first is because this is the only life she knows. It's the only life that she's even willing to accept. She can't imagine a life where there is no such thing as conflict or war or anything along those lines. But the bigger idea behind this is that because of the life that she's lived, she's grown to become ridiculously independent and doesn't see herself as somebody that can be claimed by any person. And the idea of Nathaniel showing up here using what is in effect an archaic standard of love and connection and saying that like, you're my girl. We knew each other in the past, right? You don't know me now, but you can know me again. I'm going to take you away from this place. It almost puts her in a feeling of being subservient, which is something that she immediately regrets. And so in doing so, that's what she says, like, you would you would tell me that you knew me in the past, right? She says, all this power that you have, you used to claim me as you claim this woman that you loved, except that she is not me and I am not yours. I belong to myself. And the moment that we've made, this moment we've had here will be our last. You will never see me again. And she leaves. And so in essence, and that's what's kind of cool here, is that the way Ravana Renslayer is depicted here, these different instances where she appears in the life of Nathaniel and then he loses her, that's designed to mirror the appearances of Ravana Ravonna Renslayer in the life of Cain the Conqueror. The difference is that in those lives, it was usually her being betrayed and her being killed in front of Kang or something along those lines. But regardless, no matter how the circumstance played out, it was each one of them losing the woman they loved. And in losing the woman they loved, ultimately where Kang saw that as a weakness, Nathaniel sees it as how it is that he becomes Kang. And so that's why he says, he kind of reiterates the words that were told to him by Kang, never love. And he says, as if it were a choice. And then he just kind of steps into everything, right? He accepts his role and he says, fine, if the choice was to be mine between a heart pierced by her gaze and one hardened against her, then I would choose conquest. Like in effect, he's tired of losing her, right? He's tired of, of experiencing all this loss and all this pain over and over and over again. And so what he says is my army was unwashed, untrained, savage, and cruel. But one fact is true throughout time. Slaves will become slavers when given a chance to hold the whip. And he says, Ravana was incorrect. My mind was my greatest tool for the weapons of war left behind by those magic fools in her stories were made of the very technology I had trained to repair in those long and listless childhood days. Complexity had worn on me. He says, I wish for something simple. And so I offered all the simplest choice. Join me or die. Many chose death. And so what this means is that he goes forward literally as a conqueror, that he starts to build this suit up for himself that basically looks like the suit of Cain the Conqueror, that much like Cain the Conqueror, he starts to conquer the world. And then once he gets bored conquering Earth, he sets his sights out on the entirety of the galaxy itself, right? And then the universe. And over and over and over again, taking his forces with him, he conquers everyone. And it's so cool because he says, my 100 year conquest had begun. 
He says, what had once seemed so distant, so esoteric, so impossibly vast was now within reach. I needed only wait and watch the 40th century fall before me, but I was not a man of patience. And with my time ship reforged, all of reality awaited my rule. Should I have sat surrounded by the ghosts of lost loves, pondering how I might learn from them or indulge my glory across the fabric of space-time? To Nathaniel, it may have been a quandary. To Kang, it was no choice at all. And so he says, to ground the kings of the past to dust, Arthur, most of all, his cries were not those of a hero, but of a child who thought destiny would not be swayed against him. The Cosmosian monarchs believed themselves safe in their quantum dimension. I showed them the error of their ways, then blessed their endless cities by reforging them as factories for my time-spanning war machine. Over and over and over again, it's the exact same way. He meets Immortus, he defeats Immortus. He, he meets the Scrolls, he defeats the Scrolls. The Badoon, the Shi'ar, literally the entire entire universe is conquered by Kang. That Nathaniel, and that's what's so crazy here, that where Kang, like the, the Kang that initially appeared, saw love as weakness, Nathaniel sees it as strength. Not in the sense that it's his love for Ravana Renslayer that makes him the person that he wants to become, but ultimately it was the losing of love of Ravana Renslayer that drove him to become the person that he is. And so ultimately he says, once all of this was said and done, at the end of the day, I still never found anything. I still couldn't feel anything. I had conquered the entirety of the universe, and yet something was still missing from my life. Something that I felt like I needed, that I wanted, I simply just couldn't find anymore. And so what he does is he travels back to Earth after hearing that there is a single kingdom out there that remains unconquered by his forces. And so ultimately, when he arrives here, that he ends up finding that this is the last free kingdom that's ruled by Ravana Renslayer. Now, it's, it's been quite some time since the Ravana Renslayer he immediately met, and in fact, he even comments on that. He was like, okay, it was her. It was Ravana Renslayer yet again, right? A different face, but those same eyes. And so what this seems to hit at is that Ravana Renslayer is in a lot of ways a concept, an ideology. I mean, she is a person, but the big question that has to be asked here, which we'll actually find out really in the next video, <laughs> is how it is that Ravana Renslayer keeps reappearing as different people in the time stream, right? How is it that in the days of ancient Egypt, she had appeared, albeit not necessarily uh, as the Ravana Renslayer that we're familiar with, she shows up in the modern, or really about 100 years ago in the 40th century, and then she shows up again here. And each time, she seemingly looks different. How does that happen? But the reality here is that when he does appear to Ravana Renslayer, the first thing he wants to do is win her heart, right? The first thing he wants is to have his girl back. But the reality here is she sees him as a conqueror. She doesn't see him as a person she could love. She sees him as a person that, that she absolutely hates. And so what he realizes is that the only way to get Ravana Renslayer the only way to get her love is to show her who he really is. Because the reality here, and this is one of the best things about this story, King the Conqueror, as you see him here, he's not genuinely that guy, right? Nathaniel is not genuinely some warlord that wants to conquer all of existence for no other reason than the fact that it feeds his ego. What he's, what he wants is to find some measure of meaning out there. What he's doing here by conquering everything is filling the hole in his heart that was left by not having Ravana Renslayer. But who he is at his core is a genuinely great great person, right? It's a genuinely good guy. And that's when he realizes I have to actually show her who I am in order for her to truly love me. And that's what he starts doing, right? That's literally what he starts doing is he starts basically operating as effectively a hero, right? That he calls off the attack on her kingdom. And then he frees her kingdom and says like, you do your thing, right? Like your kingdom is totally, like we are hands off. Not only that, he basically allies himself as heroes, right? The ones that were essentially time displaced, but he, ad he acts as heroes all the while his general, right, Boltag, is plotting against him. And so there comes a point where, in reality, the idea of, of Ravana Renslayer, as she appears here, being killed, does happen at the hands of Boltag, right? It does happen as him, who ultimately does shoot her. And so basically taking him out as the traitor saves the life, or seems to save the life of Ravana Renslayer. And so ultimately, he wins her heart, right? He finally gets Ravana Renslayer's love. And in that moment, Boltag shoots her, right? In the moment when he basically reveals his role as a traitor before Kang can act, Ravana Renslayer is killed. And so that's it's one of the, the coolest moments here, right? He says, I prepare to end Baltag as Kang never had, but for a moment, I stay my hand, for I have fallen in love and it has not conquered me. It is my mercy she has grown to love. I win 
and time lasts. Because once she's dead and gone, it's the thing where she says, maybe it was just never meant to be. Maybe we were just never meant to be together. And Kang basically almost breaks on this personal level, right? The one chance he had to finally have Ravana Renslayer, the closest he ever got to having the woman of his dreams, and it's yanked away. It's pulled away. Because in reality, Kang and Kang can never have Ravana Renslayer, right? It's the, the torment of him as a person. He will never get Ravana. He will never be in love with Ravana. He will never have the life he wants with Ravana. That's never going to happen. And so what he does, and this basically goes into how it is that Renslayer appears across the time stream and he says, and so it was then that I devised a new escape, my love. One the old man could never have accomplished. One that I know I already will. He spent the next 50 years mourning you when you initially died. He says in his time, right, King's time, he spent the next 50 years mourning you, trying to bring you, his Ravana, back. But I have seen your face in the distant past, and I have seen your face only a hundred years ago, and I see you here now. And where he was told never love, he says, I have already seen the ripples in the waters of time, but I remain so ignorant as to the impact that caused them. But I know now, what else could it be? I am the impact, and I I shall shatter time for you. Awake, Ravana, awake 1,000 times, and be saved by my final conquest. And so the goal of Cain the Conqueror is to quite literally shoot Ravana Renslayer's essence into the time stream and basically use that as a way to find a reality where he can have Ravana Renslayer back. So it's really cool, right? Again, it's as much a retelling as keeping components of the original origin of Kang intact. I mean, I would surmise all this is being done because of Kang in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it's really cool. Uh, in this video, and this what's really cool here about this conclusion is that this is what really solidifies Kang. And and I would say removes him from being just kind of like this ambiguous conqueror that exists out there in the multiverse somewhere that like does things from time to time and actually brings him more down to earth. Because in reality, that's kind of what Kang needed. That over the years in Marvel Comics, Kang has just kind of been this guy who exists in the future. Sometimes he shows up, he fights the Avengers every once in a while. You get like, what is it? The original Avengers Forever and the Time Keepers and Immortus and all that kind of stuff and the Destiny Force. But you never really got to see a story that focused so heavily on why Kang is the way he is. And what this one does is it really changes that. So the idea here is that following what was basically the death of Ravana Renslayer, right? The one woman he's ever loved more than any other, that Kang's desire to conquer was less about just like creating some massive empire for himself, right? In the last video, we talked about how he did that, but it left him feeling empty. It didn't fill that hole that he thought it would fill because the reality is that hole was reserved for Ravana Renslayer. But without her in the picture, he just wasn't really able to do the kind of things he wanted to do. And that's what was so cool is because he didn't feel complete. When it comes to this idea of love, and this is one of the things that I want to specify here, right? When it comes to the idea of love, I think it's very easy to take a cynical approach, right? You know, love is the only socially acceptable version of masochism, right? Like we go out into the world and we intentionally harm ourselves over and over and over again in the hopes that it won't actually hurt this time and we'll find the person we love more than any other. It's very easy to become cynical in that way when it comes to the notion of love. And for fair reason, right? I mean, there are people who have been hurt so consistently that they just by default associate love with pain because that's the only thing love has ever caused them is pain. But the reality here is that depending on who you talk to, some people will say it's worth it. And what Kang is doing here, and this is one of the things to know, the establishment of Chronopolis was not built at some place for Kang to basically rule his empire from some distant point in the future or across the entirety of the multiverse. Instead, it was to basically find his love. Love. And so when he establishes Chronopolis, one of the things to know and the easiest way to understand this is that it's like this empire, right? This citadel that he has that has strings across the multiverse. He is almost like uh, like Thor and the Bifrost, right? That like you have Asgard and you have the Bifrost Bridge that allows Thor to access any of the dimensions that are tied to the Bifrost. Chronopolis allows uh, Kang to access any of the universes that he's conquered and even some of the ones that he hasn't, right? It allows him to basically travel back and forth throughout the entirety of the time stream and the multiverse. It's just kind of his base of operations. It was also the base of operations for Immortus as well. But the thing about this is, is why, why it was built was because of the fact that what he wanted to do was create a place whereby he could essentially scatter the entirety of Ravana Renslayer's atoms across the time stream. Now, I know it sounds kind of crazy in doing that, but he literally says, I call this place Chronopolis. He says, this is where we will live, Ravana. And he says, where you'll live. I swear it, even if it takes a thousand attempts. She was not you, but she had wisdom. 
go my Ravana and be infinitely reborn in the space between the stars. So the idea behind Kang here is to basically scatter her entire existence across the multiverse and she'll be reborn in every single universe that exists across the multiverse. At that point, it's him just trying to find things. Now, what he says here is so intriguing. He says, in those moments of mastery, for I had become the master of time, I often thought that epochs and eras were measurements for lesser men that had not invented the chronology that could contain Kang. I brought the Chronopolis, the greatest monks of the Buddha, and the most enlightened Shi'ar warrior priests, and through their teachings, and on rare occasions, over their corpses, I came to an understanding. A master does not allow his love to die. Those are the actions of a boy. A master compels that which he controls to become that which he loves. Using every bit of Chronopolis's power, I unraveled the very fabric of time. I found the threads of fate and made the city its loom. And from it, I wove a machine of constant replication. I injected Ravana Renslayer's very soul into time, like a dye into the threads of an entire tapestry. Where time had taken her from me, I forced time to do the opposite, the birth of an infinite number of Ravanas in infinite timelines, giving myself infinite chances to save her. The plan was genius, it was flawless, until it began. And what we end up finding out here, and this is one of the interesting things, that Kang really is, it's almost as though Kang has this mastery of time, but he's also a slave to it. Because every single reality that he goes to, no matter what he does, she always dies. That in one reality, she dies from the plague. In another reality, she actually rejects him, right? And it takes him by surprise. But no matter what he does, and no matter how hard he tries, he always loses Ravana Renslayer. There's nothing he can do to have her. No matter what the circumstance is, there's no way to get her. And after all these countless attempts, after all these efforts, what it's done is it's turned him cold. And that's one of the things to know here. And that's one of the things to see is that while we don't necessarily know the exact origin of the original Kang at the beginning of the story that went back and visited Nathaniel, who became this version of Kang that we're seeing now, all we know is that their origins seem very, very closely intertwined. That the causation behind what made them who they are is still the exact same thing. That when he finally finds a version of Ravana Renslayer that he's that he comes to believe may love him, the reality is she rejects him. And it's not due to anything regarding his character or at least his physical form in so far that she finds him unattractive or anything like that. She rejects him because of his character and what he'd done to her. And what she really states here is she says, the great machine knows time. It sees all those who manipulate it. Plus, I could smell you across the time stream, you hideous jackal. And she says, my life, you made me believe you were a good man, and then you stole my life. And where Kang says, no, I saved you, Ravana. You saved me, and I loved you. I love you, so I saved you. The response here is she says, my life was not yours to save. My life was my life, right? I died presumably when I was supposed to or by whatever manner or whatever means. But what you've done is you've taken my life away from me, right? You have taken away my ability to actually live a life that was meant for me. Instead, every life I've ever lived across the entirety of this multiverse has all been engineered by you. Every single life has been designed like intricately by you. Not in so far as exactly how her life unfolded, but basically she was created for a purpose. And the purpose was to satisfy the desire of Kang to have someone in his life. Imagine if that were the case, right? Imagine if tomorrow somebody showed up to you to visit you and said, hey, the whole reason you exist is because I created you. And I created you for the express purpose of being my lover. Suddenly your life has no meaning. Your life has no value because the life you lived was never truly your own. And that that's what she experiences here. That's what really torments her here. And so where Kang realizes she's kind of a failure, that ultimately Kang says, okay, fine, another failure. There's nothing I can do here. He goes to attack her and basically destroy her. And in the process of this, she destroys Chronopolis, right? She says, you're the wound in the time stream, Kang. Like you fail to realize, even after all of this, you're the problem. And that's one of the things that, that Kang says here, right? He says that all that's left to do here is to cauterize the wound. And he says, I do not remember these 
moments well, right? Because just his whole manipulation with time screws with his memory. And he says, I think I did not want to remember the screams. And he says, and of course, time was collapsing. The end of my rescue operation was much closer than I'd imagined. So the mind, as it often does, while exposed to the time stream, plays tricks. It erases, efficiently redacts, and kindly revises. But I can still remember her smile and the terror that it inspired. And so literally, as the final act of this Ravana Renslayer before she's destroyed, she annihilates the entirety of the Chronopolis. And so he says, the ashes of Chronopolis are there if you look for them. No matter what your temporal position, a bit of dirt on your mantle, a penny from the distant year, a book that you swore to read. The Chronopolis, just as its very function and operation, literally exploded throughout the time stream with its atoms and bits and pieces just kind of skewed everywhere. And what he says is that in its destruction, Kang, unlike you and I, who would just kind of be blown back, maybe 100 feet or 50 feet or 500 feet or whatever it is, Kang was blown through the time stream. And so he literally fell through time. And so it's one of those things because as he was falling, he says, I arrived 10 minutes early. And then ultimately he arrived to see his younger self. And he says, I was younger than I'd remembered. Nathaniel Richards, eyes I remembered once as my own. I had felt so powerful so capable. I'd looked at Kang with disdain. The sneer was insufferable. I swore to erase it from the boy. I gave him the chance I'd been given by the monster who made me. But with the benefit of my knowledge, I would give him the trauma. I would do it right, right? I would correct the mistakes of, of essentially my father, right? I would correct the mistakes of the Kang that came to me, that visited me when I was younger and brought me through the time stream. What's so beautiful about this story is it's the relation between a father and a son. Now, it's not exactly a father and a son, but by all standards of measurement, you could argue that it is, right? Kang's parents, when he was a child, were already dead. He was basically raised without any real parents at all. So when Kang from the future came back to visit his younger self, took him under his wing into the time stream, he very much became a father figure. But what he was, was a father figure that was traumatized by his own experiences, his own abuses, his own personal torment. And as a result of that, much like a lot of parents out there, he pass that on to his child. And so it's really an answer to the question, what happens when a child is raised by a parent that never learns the real lessons of their own experiences and that they try to impart on their children the better parts of themselves, but in their failure to learn their lessons, they ultimately impart on them the worst parts of themselves. That at the end of the day, the story of Kang is cyclical. It's always a circumstance where Kang always becomes Kang. But notice this, it's not Kang showing up here and saying, I will teach you to become a conqueror so that you may enslave all of existence. No, he says, I remember the wood under my fingers, the betrayer tears that leapt unbidden into my eyes. Did his mouth taste of bile? Did I lay bleeding? Did he shiver and sweat? And he says, did he feel the noose tightened around his throat? An inescapable moment, a broken heart, hate, fury so hot it will burn the stars. And so ultimately, that's what happens, right? He says, what had been was again, the lesson he needed, the one that in my fury, I felt forced to teach a lesson. And so ultimately it's exactly the same thing that no matter what happened, no matter how things unfolded, Kang can never have Ravana Renslayer. He will never have that woman in his life. He is always destined to lose that which he loved the most. And like any rational human being out there, in the face of losing what they love the most, he felt anger. And instead of accepting the fact that that's just the way things unfolded for him, he basically took that anger and that rage and passed it on to his younger self. And what he thought was basically the right lesson to teach, never love. And so literally, the cycle of abuse just continues. That while the lessons may have been a little bit different, or how he taught his younger self may have been a little bit different at the end of the day the root cause was the exact same and so that's how kang always becomes kang that he says one last chance to save ravana i had been given one last chance and i'd done only what time demanded i was no master i was a boy it made me hate him all the more that she knew me even from the start as i danced with addy she knew she knew me for what i am but all i wanted to be was more than nathaniel richards and so in the end what he was trying to do was basically make nathaniel the opposite of him he was trying to make nathaniel a person that wouldn't become him but the lesson that nathaniel learned just like the lesson this version of nathaniel learned when he was visited by the king before him was that 
that version of Kang was a bad guy, that he would seek to destroy him, all the while failing to realize he would become him. And that's what he says, right? He says that like that younger version of Nathaniel left in the night, stealing the only time armor that he thought Kang owned. And Kang even says, run Nathaniel, run and become. You think me conquered, but it was not Kang who has died this day. For Nathaniel Richards is not a boy, nor a man, nor a hero, nor a villain. He is only a beginning. And he says, a Kang and a tyrant, a villain and a hero. We will be all things, experience all things, the beginning and ending of time and ours by immortality's boon. You will have the power of a god. And when you have lived an immortal's life, still, here you will stand, never love. And he says, how could I, when there is no one left to love? Across all of time, my Ravanas are gone, my past affixed, its loop completed. Her grip upon my heart releases, and so the husk stops. I have found my desiccation. And he says, let Armageddon be a funeral pyre, for there is but one escape from eternity's trap, and I stand upon its precipice. I need not even jump. I need merely to finally rest. Alexander wept because he could not conquer himself, but I am not Alexander. And literally that world that he's in, right? When that meteor strikes, he's there at the very moment and simply leaves, right? Just leaves on his own vessel. And he says, rest in fire, Nathaniel Richards. Rest knowing you have bested all you thought to be great in this world. Die knowing you stand astride destiny. Give your face and voice to he who created and who in turn created you. And above all things, though all on time and space may conspire to defeat you, never ever love. That's the irony of this. That's the irony and the beauty of this whole story. That when Kang, when, when this version of Kang was visited by the Kang before him, that that Kang said, never love. All it's going to do is bring you pain and suffering and sadness. And the response of Nathaniel was, that's because you didn't know love. All you knew was conquering. Love's the greatest feeling in existence. It's the greatest thing of all. And that at the end of the day, this that, that younger Nathaniel went on his quest to find a way to defeat that Kang, to destroy that Kang, to show that version of Kang that love truly is powerful. But when he encounters it, what that younger Nathaniel failed to realize is the power of love is so extreme that it can break a person on the most fundamental level. And I'm not talking about those, those guys out there who really liked the girl in their science class and they don't like them back and so love is bad. No, no, no. I'm talking about the people who gave their life to someone. Right, I'm talking about those men and women out there, right, who lived a life with somebody else, who spent years together, right, brushing their teeth next to each other for 30 years and truly understand the meaning of sacrifice, right, and that significant other just changed their mind one day and left, or they were hit by a car and they died. Whatever the case is, that that person became that person's other half, right? Like they had spent so much time together that they were intertwined in a way that can scarcely be defined. And when that person either left or, or, or was taken from them, that that person had become half their heart and half their mind and half their soul. And how do you live without that, right? And so to truly understand what it means to love and then to have that taken away and to not only have it taken away to know you can never get it back, it can break a person on the most basic and fundamental level. And that's what younger Nathaniel never accounted for. That's that's what he never considered is what that what what it really meant to love and then what it meant to never be able to have that love that's what broke him and so that's the the interesting lesson here is that at the end of the day Cain the conqueror despite all of his vaunted power and despite all the things he says and all the things he does and the grand campaigns and all that kind of stuff Kang is nothing more than a guy who exists out there in time and has experienced a broken heart an infinite number of times but with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments section. Absolutely love this story. Probably the single greatest story that's ever been told about Kang. And I will catch you all later. Peace.